the star older than the universe? How can a star be older than the universe? Well, it can't. The star in question is HD 140283, also known as Methuselah. But where do those claims come from? In short, our best estimates for the age of the universe is around 13.8 billion years. And older estimates for the age of HD 140283 is 16 billion years. And more modern ones that you might see are around 14 billion years. And that, at a first glance, seems to be a problem. How can that be? Well, we can think, let's say, the star is from the parallel universe. Or it requires rethinking of the entirety of the cosmology, but probably it's way more simple than that. So we've got two conflicting ages, but estimates both of the age of the universe and of stars, they are, you know, estimates with some uncertainties, even if they are improving with time. And unfortunately, there are no birth certificates of astronomical objects flying around in space. But this star is a great reason to talk about methods of estimating ages of stars and the universe. So let's find out what is actually going on here. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. Let's begin with the age of the universe. The idea that the universe even has an age comes from the discovery of an expanding universe. If space-time is expanding and galaxies are getting farther from each other, in a thought experiment we could run time backwards and galaxies would start moving towards each other until they got to a single point. So in the past there had to be a moment when the expansion started, what is nowadays called the Big Bang. Estimates of the age of the universe changed with our improving understanding of the universe and new data. By the way, the star older than the universe but what about our own planets? In the late 20s of 20th century, Edwin Hubble calculated the age of the universe and got the result of 2 billion years? At that time, Earth already was estimated to be up to 3 billion years old. Obviously, it turned out that those Hubble's calculations were inaccurate and in the next 100 years, a lot has changed. Now we know that the universe is expanding, not taking into account motions of galaxies due to gravity in clusters, two galaxies would recede from each other because the space-time itself is expanding. How noticeable the effect is depends on the scale. There is a value for the expansion rate known as the Hubble constant. It's a very important value for the age of the universe. Intuitively, one might think that if we, let's say, have two points in space that are receding from one another and we know how fast they are doing it at a given time, and we know the distance, we can calculate the time that has passed since those two points were in the same place, the age of the universe. Of course, in reality, it's way more complicated, and also now we're making a very big assumption that the expansion speed is constant, but we'll get back to that. So what is the value of the Hubble constant? Again, I must say that there are several, a bit different values, but for now let's use the average, which is about 70 km per second per megaparsec. Megaparsec is about 3.26 million light years. The value of the Hubble constant tells us that if two galaxies are one megaparsec apart, each second they become 70 km farther from each other, again, not taking into account their own motions. To know the time, we need to divide distance by velocity. Let's convert megaparsecs to kilometers. That is about 3 times 10 to the 19th kilometers. Now divided by 17. We get 4.41 times 10 to the 17 seconds. Now let's convert it to years and we get 13.98 billion years. That's quite close to the 13.8, but not exactly. But if we take the same data release of Planck Observatory that studied cosmic microwave background and use this value of the Hubble constant, which is about 67.66, and perform the same simple calculations, we will get almost 14.5 billion years. But where do 13.8 billion years come from? As I've already said, it's not that simple. Firstly, nowadays we know that the universe expansion rate is not the same all of the time. It's accelerating. Also, we have to take into account the composition of the universe, how much regular and dark matter, how much dark energy there is, and so on. And as a result, with this Hubble constant, accounting for various factors, we come to the conclusion that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. 
But there is another problem. Different methods of determining the value of the Hubble constant give a little bit different results. CMB measurements result in about 68 km per second per megaparsec, whereas C-feed variable measurements give 73.4. There are also methods with somewhat average results. Still, the difference is substantial enough to create an issue. That also leads to different estimates of the age of the universe and other important parameters. That can happen because of some inaccuracies in measurements, or else scientists just don't understand or don't account for something yet. This issue is even sometimes referred to as the crisis of cosmology. And also, there is even articles like this one, with the Hubble constant of 82.4 and the age of the universe of 11.4 billion years. But that's not consistent with observations of distant galaxies with high cosmological redshift values, which imply their age of over 13 billion years. Anyway, there is a chance that even the most accepted estimate of 13.8 billion years will change in future, but for now it's the best we've got. And now let's get to stars. The task of estimating the age of the universe is really hard, but determining the age of stars is uh, also really hard. Actually, there's only one star whose age we know pretty accurately. Our Sun. In short, everything in our solar system – the Sun, planets, the Moon, asteroids, etc. – formed from the same fragment of the giant molecular cloud. There is a lot of evidence for that. Objects orbit the Sun mostly in the same plane and in the same direction. Also, planets rotate mostly in the same direction, except for Venus and Uranus, which was probably caused by giant collisions in the past. This and a lot more point to the fact that planets formed in the protoplanetary disk around the infant Sun. That is also supported by observations of other systems with protoplanetary disks and possibly forming planets. Then we have ancient samples in the form of meteorites, specifically chondrites which have remained almost unchanged since the solar system formed. And methods of radiometric dating, for instance lead-lead dating, allow us to determine the age of those meteorites, hence the age of the solar system and the Sun itself, which is estimated to be over 4.5 billion years. But for other stars we basically can't measure ages directly, we can only estimate them with some precision. The more we know about the star, the better. Mass, luminosity, surface temperature, chemical composition, how active it is, how it moves and rotates, and so on. All that we have to apply to understand how a star evolves and changes over time. Sometimes we can quickly give a rough estimate. Let's say we're seeing a massive blue O-type star. Its main sequence life cycle is usually only about several million years, which means that the star has to be about several million years old. Or we can tell that the star is very old if it has very low metallicity, fraction of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. Those heavier elements are produced in processes that involve stars. If metallicity is low, that means that probably the star formed very early in the universe, which means it is billions of years old. There are many methods of determining stellar ages, and they are applied depending on various factors. Whether we are studying a single star or it is in a cluster, whether it is young or old, where it is, and so on. I'm not going to dive deep into every single method, but down below I'll leave a link to this large review of various methods. There are several types of stellar ages. For instance, fundamental ages. We know only one fundamental age of a star, and it is the Sun. Semi-fundamental ages are the ones that require only a few assumptions and those assumptions are not supposed to affect the result very much. For instance, for some individual stars in the thick galactic disk and in the galactic halo of the Milky Way, we can get good spectra and measure decay of uranium and thorium. The initial amount of those elements is assumed, so there can be some uncertainties. The second method works for young groups of stars that formed together. Studying their orbits and measuring velocities, we can reconstruct their past trajectories and calculate how much time passed since they were in a close proximity from one another soon after formation. That can be somewhat accurate for groups of stars that are at maximum a few tens of millions of years old, because it is less likely that their initial orbits would be disrupted by gravity of other objects. Then there is a whole group of methods that depend on our current understanding of stellar evolution, so-called model-dependent methods. 
studying of our sun and its properties, studying of other stars in various evolutionary stages, knowing laws of physics allows scientists to create models of stellar evolution. Let's say we had a star with known mass, chemical composition, luminosity and temperature. The model with some accuracy would be able to tell us how long the star would live and how it would change over time. Also, astronomers observe stars similar to our Sun in mass and composition, but in different evolutionary stages. One of the model-dependent methods allows to determine the age of star clusters. A very important tool is Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram. Stars in a cluster formed at about the same time. But they have different mass, which means different length of life cycles on the main sequence. Stars are placed on the diagram according to their absolute magnitude or luminosity and spectral class or temperature. And we get something like this. Then we check what stars begin to leave the main sequence. Here is a so-called turn-off point, where basically stars start dying. Then we check how massive those stars are, and the evolutionary model can tell us how old they are expected to be. For example, the Sun is expected to spend 10 billion years on the main sequence. If those stars in the cluster that began to leave the main sequence are one solar mass, and especially if they have similar composition, we can estimate their age to be about 10 billion years. And that means that the whole cluster is about 10 billion years old, and there can be less massive stars whose ages would be way more difficult to estimate if they were individual stars. HR diagram is also used with individual stars, but that's more complicated. There are other model-dependent methods based on astroseismology or lithium depletion and so on. Another group of methods uses dependencies of certain observed stellar characteristics on star's age. A good example is gyrochronology. We know that the rotation of many stars slows down with time. We can determine how fast the star rotates by looking at the periodic dips in star's brightness if those stars have spots on their surface. Such measurements were performed by Kepler Space Telescope. How much the star slows down depends on its mass. Using the relation of rotation velocity and the age, the age of a certain star can be estimated. And that's not all. But again, those were all indirect estimates and their accuracy depends on lots of factors. The more quality data we have, the better, but sometimes inaccuracies can be significant. Now we can see that both estimates of the age of the universe and the stars can have significant inaccuracies. The most obvious reason of that apparent paradox of the star older than the universe is just imperfect estimates of at least one of those two ages. In the past, the situation could be even worse. There used to be 18 or even 20 billion year old stars. In the year 2000, based on the data of Hipparchus Observatory, the age of HD 140283 was estimated to be 16 billion years, which even then seemed not right. That strange age can be a result of inaccurate distant measurements. Later, more precise parallax measurements made with the Hubble Space Telescope gave better distant estimates. And more accurate distance means better understanding of other characteristics. Then there was a 2013 article with the age value of 14.46 billion years. Still looks older than the universe, until we look here. Accounting for all of the uncertainties, the inaccuracy is plus minus 800 million years which means that minimal value is already below 13.8 billion years. The following study from the same group of scientists lowered the estimate even further to 14.27, with the same inaccuracy of 800 million years. A bit later, a different group of scientists estimated the age of Methuselah to be 13.7 with an accuracy of 700 million years, if the mass of the star is 0.78 solar mass or even 12.2 plus minus 600 million years if the mass is 0.8 solar mass, which is even at maximum is below 13.8 billion years. So the star is definitely very old, perhaps one of the oldest known stars, but of course it's not older than the universe. Determining ages of astronomical objects is very difficult, and yet the methods are getting better and better. Astronomers 100 years ago couldn't even dream of the abilities we have now. Who knows what we will learn in the next 100 years? Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.